In the last video on the channel, I restored this Amiga 1200 power tower to some semblance of its former glory. At the end of that video, I also hinted about some upgrades that I would cover in a follow-up video. Well, this is it. Let's dive right into it. So, first of all, the installation of OS 3.9 that this machine came with was in about as good of a shape as the machine itself initially was. Barely working, in other words. It did boot up, but it was giving me all kinds of grief, and those mechanical hard drives were also dubious, so I decided to ditch both the drives and the OS and start from scratch. And what better way to start from scratch than to use the newly released Amiga OS 3.2? So I went ahead and ordered a copy from amigastore.eu, including new ROM chips and a pre-installed CF card. But before I get into that, let's take a look at some hardware upgrades. Like I mentioned in the previous video, there are better solutions to connect a modern monitor to Amigas these days than to use an external converter. So let's take a look at the Indivision AGA Mark III. The Indivision AJ is an FPGA-based little device that goes directly on top of the Lisa graphics chip and produces a very sharp HDMI or VGA output. It can handle pretty much any Amiga screen mode you throw at it, and it can be configured to output a resolution suitable for whatever monitor you're using. The Mark III also has a built-in scaler and an emulated Paula sound chip that allows you to output the Amiga's sound over HDMI. The Indivision AJA Mark III includes two extra PCBs. One is a breakout board containing HDMI and VGA outputs. Either can be used, but only one at a time. The other board is a little adapter that goes on top of the CIA chip and allows the Indivision to read keyboard and mouse input. This allows you to configure scaling and screen position on the fly using the Amiga's mouse and keyboard. It's really quite ingenious. And here's another clever little device from individual computers. The Rapid Road USB interface. This card connects to the 22-pin clock port header on the A1200 motherboard, and will together with the Poseidon USB stack give you fully functional USB ports to your Amiga 1200. Another thing I needed to fix to get the new OS installed was a better IDE interface. The hard drives and CD-ROM drive in this machine were originally connected to the built-in IDE interface on the motherboard using this IDE splitter. Unfortunately, the connector on this thing is a bit sketchy. It looks like someone attempted some kind of modification at some point, and now it has intermittent contact problems. So it just wasn't very reliable. To fix this, I decided to try another approach. So I ordered a Fast8A Mark V IDE controller. This is a device that, like the Indivision AGA, plots onto one of the Amiga custom chips. In this case, the uh, Gale chip, which handles, amongst other things, the ATA interface. The Fast8A controller consists of a main board that sits in the ROM sockets and a breakout board that goes on top of the Gale chip. The ROM chips then sits on the Fast8A main board. It's a bit of a convoluted solution, but works quite well once installed. The benefits, apart from having dual full-size IDE channels, is that it's quite a bit faster than the built-in interface. My tests in sysinfo indicates around 7 megabytes per second. Not quite the 16 megabytes per second that's advertised as the top speed, but way faster than the 2 megabytes per second or so that you'll get from the built-in interface. By the way, I should mention here that I'm currently using a Blizzard 1230 accelerator, which might be a limiting factor on speed here. The Apollo 1240 that I had in here in the restoration video refused to boot after I tried replacing the 16 megabyte stick of RAM with a 32 megabyte one. The card was just plain dead after that, even when putting the original 16 megabyte stick back in again. I have no idea what went wrong there, but I suspect it's a contact issue with the edge connector or the PLCC chips, or both. I'll troubleshoot and try to fix it later, but for now the Blizzard 1230 is a reliable, albeit slower, backup. Alright, now that both video output and internal storage is taken care of, it's time to install the new OS. Since I ordered a pre-installed CF card, this was as simple as just plopping the new card in the CF adapter and booting up. No fuss whatsoever, it just worked. 
In addition to the installed OS itself, Amiga Store was kind enough to include a copy of the CD-ROM on the CF card, which would be very handy if you don't have a CD-ROM drive attached to your Amiga. They also included a few games and demos on the card, as well as a working installation of WHD Load. The next step, now that the OS is up and running, is to get some additional software and drivers for the Indivision AGA and the Rapid Road USB. And of course, these things are available from this awesome place called the Internet. So let's get this Amiga online. First, I had to install a TCP IP stack and drivers for the networking card. I had the files I needed for this on a CF card, but I had to mess around for a while before I could locate everything. So I'm just gonna fast forward here. Alright, so now we have Miami DX TCP IP stack installed, so let's go ahead and set it up. First thing is to create the network interface using the cnet.device driver. I'm just going to call it eth0 here. Next step is to create an interface for the network adapter, and we're going to create a internet interface here, and set everything to DHCP. And then under the TCP IP settings, select add for dynamic DNS servers and check DHCP and set host name. And I'm gonna call it Amiga 1200T here. And that's it. Now we can go online. For some reason, you have to press the online button twice because the first time it doesn't go online but then press it again and now we're online so now we can just uh, send the miami dx to the background and fire up a web browser and we're on the internet so the first thing i'm gonna do is i'm gonna get something called card reset off of aminet card reset is a utility that you can run in your startup sequence that will reset pc and cia cards this allows you to circumvent a bug in the Gale ship that causes PCMCIA cards to not initialize properly during boot. And it's required in this case to make the networking card work without needing to remove and reinsert it after each boot. Once it's downloaded, just copy it to a C and then add it to the user startup file. Next, I'm gonna download and install AMI SSL, which makes it possible to load websites over HTTPS. It's very easy to install, just download, unarchive, and run the included installer. Alright, now that we have all the internet connectivity stuff up and running, let's go ahead and download the configuration utility and extra screen modes for the Indivision AGA. So the Indivision configuration utility might look a little bit intimidating at first, but it's really quite simple. Here on the main screen, on the right side, you can select between different Amiga screen modes. This won't change the screen mode you're currently using, 
This will just allow you to tweak the settings for that particular screen mode and map it to a VGA mode that the Indivision will output. So in this case here, for instance, we're on uh, double PAL 640 by 512. So whenever the Amiga outputs this screen mode, the Indivision is gonna map it to this VGA mode. And I can configure the VGA mode by clicking that little arrow there and selecting a VGA mode here. And then if I go into test adjust, then I get a test picture like this and I can configure its position and stuff like that. Um, so when I'm happy with the mode for this particular screen mode, I just uh, go accept and uh, then it will, when I hit save and apply, it's gonna save it to the firmware in the Indivision. But yeah, that's pretty much all there's to it. So these are the screen modes that you can download from the Indivision site. So to use these, you just uh, put them under devs monitors, just copy them there and reboot. Then they're gonna show up uh, in the uh, screen mode preferences utility. So yeah, that's about it for the Indivision. Of course, you don't need to download and use the configuration utility and extra screen modes and stuff. The uh, card will work just fine without those things, but they will allow you to have a little bit more control over stuff. All right, only one thing left to do now. In order to use the Rapid Road USB card I mentioned earlier, I need to get a USB stack installed. So I'm gonna go on the web again and download the Poseidon USB stack. Once downloaded, I extracted the archive and ran the installer. The USB card kicks into action as soon as the installer has finished, but I had an issue where it wouldn't work again after rebooting the machine. Turns out the installer had omitted copying a file called PSD stack loader to the nvarc volume. That issue was easily solved by simply copying the correct file there manually. So now USB devices such as mice and keyboards and USB sticks can be used by this Amiga. Very handy indeed. Something to be aware of with USB sticks is that they need to be formatted with a master boot record partition table for the Amiga to recognize it. So that's pretty much it. This Amiga has now been brought into the 21st century with fast IDE drives, crisp VGA output, internet connectivity and fully functional USB ports. I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, please do consider subscribing to the channel. Take care and see you next time.